Thank you, folks. Good afternoon, everybody. How are we feeling energized after the coffee? I will take it as a no. Thank you. Great. Let's get started. Let's get started. Like, so my talk today uh, is going to be about why Kubernetes native infrastructure is the future, a look at cross-plane. I submitted this talk back in July for this precise conference, and thank you very much to all the organizers with Cloud Native Days for accepting it. But one thing that I realized while I was building this talk is that I didn't want to talk only about the tool. I didn't want to talk about Crossplane itself. What I was interested in was rather how infrastructure as code and how managing infrastructure in the cloud has been changing over the last couple of years. So a better title for my talk is actually why Kubernetes native infrastructure is the future, infrastructure as data. And by all means, if you're interested in Crossplane and you want to hear more about Crossplane, please stay seated. We're going to talk about it, I promise. I guess the idea here is that I don't want to talk about the specific tool only. I want to talk about the way things have been changing and the way I see the cloud computing, uh, um, you know, the cloud computing world changing in the next years. Before we move into the technical details, before we move into, you know, listing YAML files one after the other, I'm joking, uh, there is one concept that I would like, you, I would like to quickly mention. It's the idea of paradigm shift. I'm sure most of you are familiar with what, what is a paradigm shift and what means a uh, paradigm shift. But in general, paradigm shift is something that happens in many industries outside the world, many industries outside tech as well. As you can see, I, I took this screenshot from uh, Investopedia, so it's something that happens as well in the economic world. And it's something that happens whenever a company, an individual, comes into a world with uh, an idea, a way of seeing things that is different from the status quo that is different from the way we have been doing things up until now. And over the course of uh, our industry, we can pretty much recognize many of these moments, right? VMs, right? OpenStack, containers, Kubernetes, and so on and so on. There have been many moments during, this, uh, during our, um, our industry where paradigm shift has been, has been a thing. There are two things, though, that happen whenever a paradigm shift enters an industry, whenever there is a new idea that comes into town. And this applies to any industries out there, not only tech. The first thing is that this new idea is always, always, always seen with a certain level of skepticism, right? Somebody comes to an industry with an idea that is revolutionary, that changes the status quo, and by default is already seen as something you know, people are skeptical about. The second thing, is that companies that don't manage to recognize paradigm shift fast enough tend to suffer the consequences. Can we make a quick poll here? Who ever owned a Nokia mobile phone? Can you please raise your hand? Who owns a Nokia mobile phone today? One, two, three, four. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, Nokia was, a, was the perfect example of a company that, in my opinion, failed to recognize two main paradigm shifts. The first one was touchscreen, right? Touchscreen came into the industry of mobile phones. And do you remember the first touchscreens? They were horrible. They were fragile. They would break often. They were expensive to repair. They were not accurate at all. And most of all, the devices were not supporting them well. We didn't have an app store. We didn't have application that would support touch screens in the nice way. And this is the second thing that Nokia missed, the advent of uh, app store, right? By the time Nokia realized that those two paradigm shifts were happening, were actually a thing in the mobile industry, they were already too far behind. They were already too far behind Google and Apple that had very mature app stores and so on. So Nokia tried to catch up by partnership with Microsoft, but yeah, I mean, just looking at the poll, you can see how this ended, right? But who am I to talk to you about paradigm shift and infrastructure? My name is Andrea, Andrea Giardini. I'm Italian, as you can probably guess from the accent and the movement of my hands. Uh, I'm a CNCF ambassador and a cloud native, independent cloud native consultant and trainer. So I work with a lot of different clients on infrastructure and cloud projects. And if you've done infrastructure more than a month, you pretty much know the tool the, for an excellent tool that has been used for many, many years now whenever we talk about infrastructure and infrastructure as code. And you've probably heard of Terraform, right? Who hasn't heard of Terraform? 
Terraform is a, a tool that right now is the de facto standard, right? Whenever we think about infrastructure, an infrastructure that is built in the right way, in the proper way, in an extendable way, we think about Terraform. Terraform has been there for quite a while. And when Terraform was first announced, it was a paradigm shift on its own, right? We were used to, you know, changing things manually in the AWS console, having our own bash script, maybe some Ansible puppet and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, when it came out almost 10 years ago, it was released in July 2014, I checked, um, many people were skeptical. Terraform was his own paradigm shift, right? The HCL language was messy. It was supporting very few providers. It was clunky. It was not working that well. And yeah, in the beginning, it was just really, really bad. But with time, more and more adoption drove, the, drove Terraform to be one of the leading tools for infrastructure as code and pretty much a synonym for infrastructure that is done in the right way. As I've been in the industry for quite some time, I've been using Terraform for quite some time. And I like it. Terraform is a great tool that advanced our industry by you know, years, you know, made things so much easier and so much simpler for us. I generally like Terraform most of the times. You know, there are still moments <laughs> where I wish there was something better, when I wish there was something different, let's put it this way. And as I work with different clients, as I work with different projects, there are three situations that I usually encounter when working with uh, Terraform and cloud infrastructure. The first situation is the one that I like the best. You join a project and there is good Terraform code. You can get access to the repository and they're using a Terraform version that is maybe not the latest, but rel relatively new. They're using uh, sub-modules, so the code is very well modularized. They are using providers that are decently up to date. And it's just easy to change things, right? I want to introduce something new in my infrastructure. It's easy for me to change the infrastructure and make it better. It's not a struggle. It's not something that I have to you know, force myself into. Then there is the second case, where the project I join has bad Terraform code. Terraform version is outdated. Submodules that are like from the past decade. Uh, modularization is non-existent. We have Terraform files that are like thousands and thousands of lines long. Pretty horrible, pretty bad, right? It's difficult to change things. It's difficult to introduce new features. It's difficult to change the status quo, really. But there is a third case that happens sometimes. Can you guess what's the third case? When there is no Terraform code. And this is the absolute worst, right? I mean, you get into a company, you're like, OK, can I get access to your uh, infrastructure as code repository? And they were like, what? What, what infrastructure as code repository? <laughs> we, we don't do that here. And this is what thi where things get tricky, right? This is when you, get, you go to the AWS console, it, it looks like a scene out of Jumanji, pretty much. There's like things going on everywhere. Uh, you don't understand how things are linked with each other. It's really difficult to trace dependencies. And this is one of the most complicated uh, you know, situations you can find yourself into. Because after all, you know, Bad Terraform code is always better than no Terraform code. And if you've used the Terraform import command more than once, you probably know that as well. Even more, have you ever tried changing Terraform state or having a Terraform state that is corrupted? I sweat every time I have to make a Terraform state move. It's just so stressful, the fact that all your infrastructure is just in a small YAML file stored on a S3 bucket. It's, uh, it's so easy to mess up things. As I was preparing this talk, I asked myself this question. Why does it seem so easy to end up with a complex Terraform code? Not necessarily bad, but complex. Why I start working in a project, the Terraform code is pretty good, it's nicely modularized. We go on holiday for like a couple of weeks, and when we come back, it's like it's the jungle, pretty much. And I think there are a couple of reasons for this. The first reason, is that requirements change and refactoring Terraform code is difficult. As our company grows, if we're working for a startup, maybe it's getting bigger, or if we're, if we're working already for a big company, maybe there is some shuffling in the way teams are organized. You know, requirements change, and it's normal that requirements change. But changing Terraform code and modularizing it and reorganizing it and refactoring 
it's really, really, really complicated. If things go, got you know, much, much better after version one, when you know, all this kind of like extra tooling has been added on top of it, it allows us to you know, sort of refactor Terraform code. But things are far from perfect. I would 100% refactor some Python code over some Terraform code. You know, at the end of the day, this thing is holding your whole infrastructure state, right? The second reason why I think it's very easy to go from good Terraform code to bad Terraform code requires a little extra explanation. This is how Terraform works. I'm sure you all, most of you are familiar with it, but pretty much when I start writing a new project, what happens is that I open my editor, I start writing some uh, Terraform code, some HCL, I eventually modularize it in some different folders, in a nicely folder structure, and then what happens next is that I plan. Terraform plan, what it does is that it takes your code, tries to figure out all the dependencies between different components of your infrastructure, and then makes a DAG, pretty much, like a sequence of operation that Terraform has to do in order to create the infrastructure that you specified in your Terraform file. And finally, the last step is the apply. Apply is like a very simple step of Terraform. It just takes the plan that has been made in a previous step and just executes it one after the other. It creates resources one after the other in the order that they need to be created, right? Following a certain plan, following a certain uh, cycle of dependency. And then once we are at this stage, what we do is go back at the top. We write some more, we plan some more, we apply some more. We write some more, plan some more, and apply some more. The code that we write with Terraform is very consistent, meaning that there are no surprises, right? Most of the time, we write our Terraform code. The Terraform plan generates a plan, exactly a plan, that Terraform has to follow in a certain order to make things run properly, right? To get your resources up in the right sequence. So we are using code and we're using a tool, Terraform, that is very consistent to manage the cloud, which is, as every distributed system, eventually consistent. The cloud is not, cons is not consistent per se, it's eventually consistent. Think about Kubernetes. What happens when you create a new deployment? When you do kubectl apply dash f deployment.yaml? Well, kubectl returns back to you immediately, but does that mean that your application is ready to serve traffic? No. Kubernetes has to do a couple of different things in the background to make sure that your application runs well. It has to create the pods, it has to pull the Docker images, set up the networking. There are a whole set of things that happen in the background, right? It is the control loop that takes care of them, right? The control loop has a, a, always does this operation over and over. It looks at your desired state, which is what you're storing in a TCD. It looks at, at the actual state of the cluster and tries to reconcile these two states together over time. If the two states are the same, well, the control loop does basically nothing. If the two states differ, they tr it will try to bring your cluster state as close as possible to your desired state. And this difference, the fact that we are using a tool that is extremely consistent to manage something that is eventually consistent, is what generates some issues that, we, that all of us, I think, have experienced with, uh, with Terraform. In particular, if we look at the Terraform module, if we look at the Terraform code, we will see that Terraform fixes this way, these issues in the way software engineers have been fixing race conditions since the beginning of time. What's that way? How do you fix a race condition? Who said that? Sleep. If you go in the Terraform documentation, how do you mitigate eventual consistency? You add sleeps. This is official Terraform documentation, I'm not joking. And if you look all the in the code, this is all over the place, right? Polling wait time. Poll until the resource is found due to eventual consistency issue. Of course, we're using something that is consistent to manage an infrastructure that is eventually consistent. So we are going to face this kind of problem. And polling itself is, is not that, you know, it's not the only, it's not part of the, it's part of the problem, but it's not the only issue. The thing is that since we have to manage two things that are one consistent and one eventually consistent, we need to do all the little hacks around, like retrying error 404s. Why? Because Terraform creates a resource in the cloud. The cloud returns, OK, I created that resource. And then Terraform has to wait until the next resource gets created. And so it will ping the API 
and just retry on code 404, which is a client error, right? Usually it's 404, it's a, cli it's a HTTP code that you would not retry, ex except, except in like, a few different reasons. But this leads to all kinds of issues. What happens if you, like in this case, you delete a bucket outside of Terraform, what happens here is that your Terraform plan, your Terraform apply hangs forever because it's waiting for a resource that is not there. But again, it's not polling per se that is bad, especially you know, when there are no alternatives. I guess the idea that I want to bring is that we are humans and we're not robots. We should let the robot do the automated things and we should do robots do the loop of plan, apply, write, plan, apply, write. Because the truth is that if you don't see a control loop, you are the control loop. You are the one looping on Terraform, trying to you know, get this state to be consistent in a way or another. This is another of the big issues with Terraform. What happens if somebody changes your infrastructure outside of Terraform in a way or another? You are going to realize only the next time you run Terraform apply that there is a difference going on in your cluster, that your desired state and your actual state are not the same. And this is why today I wanted to talk a little bit about infrastructure as data, and we will talk about Crossplane as well, because Crossplane is a, a tool that implements the concept of infrastructure as data. The idea with infrastructure as data is not to treat infrastructure as code, but as a set of resources. In this case, we will see there will be Kubernetes resources. And I see some people raising their eyebrows already, like, oh, we want Kubernetes to, to manage my VPC. I don't feel comfortable with that. And I understand that. But if you think about it, this is something that we have been doing already. What happens when you create a service of type load balancer? The cloud controller manager goes to your cloud provider, requires us to create a new load balancer, and configures the load balancer to route traffic to your cluster. So in a way, you are already managing your cloud resources using Kubernetes object, a service object. Another example. PVC. You create a persistent volume claim. What happens? The cloud controller goes to the cloud provider, asks for some block storage, and attaches that block storage to the right VM. So now we're managing our ingress, so all the traffic that is incoming, and all our storage using Kubernetes object. You're starting to sweat already? <laughs> but there is a third example that is even more, you know, even bigger than that. Is anyone using external DNS here? Well, not as many people. Well, external DNS is a pretty popular project that has been uh, going on in, uh, in, uh, in Kubernetes world and basically allows you to manage your DNS zone using Kubernetes. In this way, whenever you create a new ingress, a new DNS record is added automatically for you in your DNS zone. So now Kubernetes is managing your incoming traffic, your storage, and your DNS zone already. The idea behind infrastructure as data is, why don't we take this concept and just make it general. Why don't we start managing buckets, databases, and everything else as data? Why don't we start managing things as objects inside Kubernetes rather than code in HCL? And we will see in a second why this fixes at least some of the problems that, are, uh, that, are, you know, that, that, that we have in Terraform. The project I want to talk about is Crossplane. Some of you might be already familiar with it, some of you might have heard of it, but the idea behind Crossplane is to treat every object inside Kubernetes. Every cloud, every cloud um, resource will be treated as a Kubernetes object, which is an idea that is you know, different, revolutionary, scary, and of course, you know, like I, I understand if you think about this with a certain dose of skepticism, but this is also part of the paradigm shift, remember that. How does it work, Crossplane? I, took, I made here a small example to show you like quick capabilities of Crossplane. Well, first of all, we need to install Crossplane. Installing Crossplane is pretty straightforward with a Helm install. There is nothing uh, fancy or particular about that. And after that, Crossplane allows us to manage our resources in different providers. So we have the possibility of managing resources in AWS, GCP, Azure, and so on. So we have, to, first of all, to install a provider uh, object, so we have to create this provider object, and all of this happens with a kubectl apply, or nothing more than that, something that you are, all of you, most of you at least, are already familiar with. 
And then I have to specify different provider configs. You know, I can, for example, create a, a different provider config for every project that, yeah, that I have inside my AWS account or inside my GCP account, right? And this is all I need to get started. I just need to give Crossplane a way to manage my cloud infrastructure in my project. After that, what we are going to do is model our infrastructure as data. Keep in mind that since all of these are custom Kubernetes resources, I can kubectl explain them. I can say kubectl explain bucket, and in my kubectl output, I will see all the different options that I have to create a bucket on GCP. In this case, I'm creating a bucket called Crossplane Demo Swiss Cloud Native, and I'm creating it in the EU. Over here, instead, I'm creating a database, right? The Crossplane Demo Swiss Cloud Native, again, I want a database called po with um, database version Postgres 10 in the region EU, EU West 1 on a small instance with a disk size of 20 gigabytes. Now, let's take this example. Let's take these two resources that I created as data and modeled as YAML files. And let's say that we want to wrap them together, right? We want to give a way to our developers to be able to use these resources, right? What we can do is say that these two resources are part of developer environments, right? I am a developer. I'm building a new patch for my software. I create a pull request. I want to test it somewhere. I want to test it ideally in an environment that is as close as possible to production, right? So I might want to have some developer environments. And my, develop my software uses a bucket and a database instance, and I can use the crossplane cap cross capabilities to create these two things as Kubernetes object, as even part of my Elm charts. Why not? And since these two are objects in the Kubernetes world, I can, of course, kubectl get them. I can describe them. I can delete them. I can, yeah, pretty much do whatever I want, right? They're customizable. This is all due to the power of Kubernetes API. The, you know, the, the great things about Kubernetes is not so much, in my opinion, the auto-scaling, uh, the fact that it's self-healing and so on, but the fact that we have the possibility of taking its APIs and extending it in the way we want, in the way that is best for our company, it's what makes it a really good, uh, a really good fit. Before we have a look at more structured ways of uh, you know, dealing with Kubernetes resources, let me just bring up this image that shows you the idea behind Crossplane. So what we have done right now is that we have created some managed resources. Managed resources are just objects in Kubernetes cluster that are linked to an external resource in your cloud provider, like a database or a bucket. So by kubectl applying those two, um, those two manifests, I've created two managed resources. What I want to do now is set up this layer. I want to set up a line that, that, uh, that draws what's the limit between the app team concerns and the platform team concerns. And, uh, and Crossplane gives us the possibility to do that with these four objects. Composition, composite resource, composite resource definitions, and claim. Yes, the name is confusing. Yes, they could have done a little bit more work on that. I agree. <laughs> but let's take it step by step. It's much easier than you think. One more thing. If you came to this talk thinking that Crossplane will let you write yes, less YAML, you're deadly wrong. Crossplane will let you write a lot more YAML. Let's get started with composition. The easiest thing ever. Composition is just a set of managed resources. So in my previous example, I had a bucket and a database, and that's what we're going to find here. So we create, again, a Kubernetes resource called Composition with the name Swiss Cloud Native. Then I need to add some uh, composite type ref. So this will be part of my customer source definition. In this case, I specified an API version of uh, cloudnativeday.ch slash v1 alpha 1. And the kind of my uh, customer source definition is dev environments, because I want to create a dev environment object that my, my developers can create, that they can use. In this way, whenever they create a new object of type dev environment, everything will come up magically for them. They will have a new bug that they can use for testing, a new database that they can play with. After that, I pretty much just copy-pasted the previous slide. So I just copy-pasted the resources that I, want this, uh, uh, that I want this composition to have, a storage bucket and the database. 
Finally, this last section will become clear in the next slide. There is a section called patches that allows us to inject dynamically certain configuration. So what I'm doing here, for example, is making the region of my database customizable. So I my developers can specify if they want a database in a specific region. And if they don't specify that, by default, they will get it in EU West 1. So composition is just a collection of different managed resources. Nothing more than that, nothing special. Composite resource definition. This is where things get verbose. This is where your YAML files are going to explode. Because in a composite resource definition, what I'm doing is defining the interface between the platform team and the development team. And I do that using an open API, pretty much. So in this case, we said that we want our developers to take care as little as possible about infrastructure. We want to give them eventually the possibility to specify the region of our database. Nothing more than that. So this is going to be quite, quite short and quite simple. I create a resource of type composite resource definition. I have, to, again, to specify the group and the names. So I want, again, group cloudnativeday.ch, the names, dev environment, plural, dev environments. And then I have my open API definition, right? Open API schema, version 3, blah, blah, blah. The only properties that I'm, allow I'm allowing people to set is the region. So the developers can query and create object, create dev environment object, and they have the possibility to specify one optional parameter, which is the region of my database. If they, if they don't specify it by default, they get the US one. If they specify it, whatever they specify is going to be the region of their database. And then we are pretty much done. The next two resources, composite resource and claims, are basically the way our developers deal with our infrastructure. The only difference between the two of them is that one of them is namespaced and the other one is not. So how does it look like? What does our developer need to do whenever they want to create a new dev environment in our infrastructure with a bucket that is customized for them and a database where they can specify a region? They have to create an object like this. I'm creating an object of type test with the name test. It has a kind dev environment. And I decided in this case that I don't want to specify a region. I'm fine with the default one. If I would want to specify a region, I mean, it doesn't get much easier than this, right? And remember, these are all things that I can kubectl explain. They're all things that with kubectl I can get a nice output that tells me all the different parameters and all the different options that, uh, that, our, uh, that our composite resource and claim have, which is pretty nice. And this is why I like crossplane. And this is why I also like the idea of infrastructure as data, really. It provides a clear and defined separation between the platform team and the infrastructure, the, sorry, the platform team and the development team. This is something that I always found pretty tricky with Terraform most of the time. It's always uh, a little bit blurry where the limit is. Sometimes it happens that the development team needs to modify some things in the Terraform code, but then they don't do it in the proper way. And so things that, you know, like start fighting with each other a little bit. And instead, in this way, we're providing them with an open API. They can query our, uh, they can query our Kubernetes control plane. Uh, and since they're all Kubernetes objects, I can apply all kinds of policies, right? Open, uh, open policy agent, right, OPA. I can, I can decide that some, of, some people are allowed to create any kind of dev environment and some other people don't. I can set some, uh, some schedule to clean up dev environment that would not only clean up the resources, but also the buckets, the database, and so on behind it, which is pretty nice. One thing you should know is that this was not the first attempt to integrate cloud and Kubernetes to manage infrastructure using Kubernetes resources. There were two projects, the Kubernetes Service Ta Catalog and Kubeform, that attempted that some years ago. How many of you are familiar with these two projects? Can you quickly raise your hand? One person, two person. That's because they're dead. They, they never saw the light of the day, really. I mean, they saw the light of the day, but they never managed to break through the, the paradigm shift. They never managed to get the critical mass to make this technology a reality, really. Why is that? There might be different reasons. This came very early, 
came some years ago, when already Kubernetes itself was a paradigm shift in the way we were doing things. We were used to you know, virtual machines, OpenStack, Puppet, Chef, all that kind of things. And so you know, managing your own infrastructure with Kubernetes sounded scary at times. But now we know how to do it. We do it already. We don't, just don't do it to the extent that Kubernetes Service Catalog, Kubeform, and Crossplane do it. A second reason is probably because you know, Upbound, the company behind Crossplane, has a big marketing uh, budget. But things get better. Things get better. If this sounds a little bit too much for you, and you're working mainly on a single cloud, only on AWS, only on Google Cloud, only on Azure, things get a lot better for you. Because each one of our cloud providers, you might not know that, but they have their own way of Kubernetes that is uh, managed for you inside that cloud provider. Google Config Connector, AWS Service Operator, Azure Service Operator, they do exactly the same thing that Crossplane does, but they're limited to a single cloud provider, obviously. So if you are working on a single cloud provider, I would, very I would very much recommend to check them out instead of trying Crossplane. Because at the end of the day, these components are managed for you. You don't need to update them. You don't need to secure them. You don't need to deal with like weird upgrade path. They just come out of the box. With that said, as every new technology, as every, everything you know, new that comes into the market, things are, uh, are far from perfect. And Crossplane itself and the tools that I mentioned before are far from being perfect. There are still many rough edges. There are still many things that can be improved. The developer experience sometimes is not the best. But still, I think it's something that is worth giving it a try. All this to say that your experience might vary. So there are some people, uh, this one is an article that came, uh, came out back in June, highlighting some reasons why Crossplane didn't work for them. Why they investigated Crossplane, they really gave it a try, but things were just not as good as they thought. And that's totally fine. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't pretend that everybody should just trash all their Terraform code and move to Crossplane. What I'm trying to say here is that you should give it a try. You should start thinking about it in this way a little bit and see if that model fits your company or not. So in this case, Masterpoint was, was a little bit dubious about Crossplane and the way to integrate Crossplane. But I, I'm more than happy to say that there are some people that outright disagree with what I'm saying today. And one of those people is Adam Jacob, which is the co-founder of Chef, which probably knows a lot more about infrastructure than I do. <laughs> but I very much recommend that you go and check out this talk on YouTube that he gave uh, some months ago called What If Infrastructure's Code Never Existed? I find this to be like a very nice way of thinking about things. Let's think about infrastructure and infrastructure as code as if infrastructure as code never existed. With all the learnings that we had over the past 10 years, let's try to build a new way of doing infrastructure, a new way of managing our cloud resources with all the best practices, but ignoring the fact that infrastructure as code already exists. To me, really, the only thing that is important and that I hope you get back from this talk is that there is space and there is, in certain cases, also need for a change. So if you banged your head on Terraform code and you asked yourself, there must be an easier way of doing things, maybe you should give it a try. Maybe you should take a little bit of time and experiment with cross or, in general, infrastructure as data. My idea here is that industry is, is shifting. Industry is changing. We are already in an industry that evolves continuously and all the time. And more and more ways of managing infrastructure came up in the, next, in the last years, right? Think about Pulumi, another super nice tool to use for still infrastructure as code, but without all the HCL weird things going on, right? And also company are adapting. Even Terraform themselves now has uh, an operator, a Kubernetes operator for Terraform. So in my opinion, industry is shifting a little bit. There is space and there is need for a change. And we just, we, I think we're just all waiting for the next idea to come out. And it might not be cross spring it might not be infrastructure as data, but to me what is clear is that there is a need and there is the space for change. Thank you for listening to me, and if you have any questions, so, yeah, please raise your hand. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrea. Are there questions for Andrea? Sorry. <laughs> 
First of all, uh, thanks, Andrea, for presenting. Really interesting. Uh, and also thank you for like not just preaching about like crossplane, but also showing that there are some downsides or there could be like <clears throat> negative experiences as well. I was just wondering like um, in 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 the case of like multi cloud because this like if I think about the concept, it really works well if you have one Kubernetes cluster that is managing one infrastructure, which is for one team. Mm -hmm. How would you like extend this for a multi cloud environment, and where would you put like the sort of control plane of of, of your multi-cloud environment? Would you like put it, uh, each, 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 like, each cross-plane sort of like um, CRDs on the target like um, cloud platforms or would you like have it on, on a specific one and then reach the others or how would you? Like, That's a very it? good question. Thank you for asking this. Very good question. Um, first of all, in the beginning what you've seen uh, is that the provider and the provider config, they're separate. So. Crossplane still leaves us the ability to say, okay, I want you to manage all the projects that are on my AWS or one project that are on my AWS, which is pretty nice because it's, a no, it's not an all-in solution, right? You can still adopt it gradually, pretty much. What, what I've seen is that generally what people like to do is, uh, I mean, there are very few people that do multi-cloud, and this is why I also recommend other tools that are more like cloud-specific. like cloud specific. Um, Generally, what happens is that com like the platform team takes care of the cross-plane, all the dependencies, all the configuration in the cloud they are more familiar with or where they, s where they see themselves never moving away from, right? So there will be one account, which would be like the master like infra account that would manage different uh, projects even across different clouds. Again, uh, I will give you the consultant answer. It depends, like how big is your company, how is structured, the ma how many teams you have. But it's uh, yeah, this this one one solution that works works well for some people. Yeah, thank you. Any other question? We're here. I'm not sure if I'm. Able that's a long. Uh, that's a long. I'll try it anyway. <laughs> Whoa, nice. Yeah. So uh, we tried the Azure Service Operator and it didn't work for us. We briefly looked at Crossplane itself as well. And uh, our biggest issue there was that it didn't uh, support all the resources we needed. And if it did, then only in legacy versions or not at all. Um, has the situation gotten better meanwhile? It was one or two years ago now. Um, or yeah. what provider in the back end is Crossplane, for example, using? Yeah, I mean, the situation got, got a lot better. You know, like as I was saying, like even tools like Terraform at the beginning, they were like quite, you know, supporting very few resources or not in the nice way. A and the Crossplane team has done a lot of work in that direction, meaning that now they have uh, um, different providers for different, uh, you know, different providers for different clouds, but also they try to support as many resources as they can. I mean, that in certain cases, they even auto generate part of the code starting from the open API definition of the cloud provider. So the adoption, the, the support for resources has definitely improved. Then, you know, like, of course, <laughs> to get the latest resource that has been just announced by a cloud, by a cloud provider, it might take a while. But it's, uh, you know, if you're using the standard resource, you're using EKS or GKE with some cloud buckets uh, and, um, and uh, storage buckets and things like this, you're pretty much covered right now. Yeah, you know, like, like all, all projects that are new, they evolve really fast at the beginning, right? In, in one big critique that went to the cross-plane project, especially in the early days, is that they would change their APIs all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so you know that's when you're dealing with YAML, especially it's it's a bit of a nightmare. Now they got a lot more, uh, they got a lot better on that. You know, thanks to the communities built around it, uh, and uh, yeah, thanks to the fact that they are also able to generate certain providers directly from uh, from the Open API definition. Any other question? Maybe from my side, have you tried to about it? Uh, have you tried to use the Terraform and Crossplane together, it means running Terraform from Crossplane, or what could be, is there any right balance, or is it a choice, this or that? That's a very good question. That's a very good question. Um, let, me, let me see how... The thing is, like, I think it's nice if you see this as a transition phase, okay? You say, look, I'm starting a new project. I will give Crossplane a try. 
and see if it fits my use case or not. Using both of them together, you know, you can go in all kind. It's like using, you know, two separate uh, CNI for your cluster. At a certain point, they're going to, to conflict with each other, I have the feeling. Uh, or you keep them really separate, like, okay, this project is managed using Crossplane, and this project is managed using Terraform. In that case, there is absolutely no problem. But using them together to manage resources inside the same project, I don't know, it's not something I would recommend unless it's a transition phase, like you're moving from Crossplane to Terraform or from Terraform to Crossplane. Let's put it this way. Uh, I just have a small question about um, kind of the state that then we have in Crossplane. Because mm -hmm. you said, for example, for a developer that wants to create a dev environment, you're just going to kubectl create a resource mm -hmm. and it will be pulled up. What if you have to do like a cluster rebuild or something on, the, uh, on this master cluster that kind of then controls all of this infrastructure? Then how do you restore the state more or less to you? Yeah, I mean... In here, when I said that you create resources and so on, I'm still imagining, uh, I simplify saying kubectl apply, but I'm still imagining a proper like GitOps pipeline or something like that. So I, it's not me, developer, going and doing kubectl apply on my master infrastructure cluster. Well, that would be a bad idea. But it would be, you know, like I create a resource in a Git repository, I push that resource, and then Argo CD or whatever creates that resource for me inside the cluster. But indeed, like restore is one of the places where a cross plane does not excel yet like restoring if like getting in, getting a resource that is already existing in your cloud cluster and link it back to a resource in kubernetes is not the easiest thing ever at least at the moment yeah good point thank you was there another one back there i don't know if i can do that. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I kind of want to go back to the question before, because I don't know if you ever have used Kubevella or have been no, in that space, because they moved from their project, they were mainly based on the cross-plane, but they actually implement both now. Okay. So they have cross-plane, for CRDs, but they noticed it's kind of too slow in the development, and they also provide for each cloud provider their specific Terraform uh, controllers, which also abstract Terraform resources as CRDs. But uh, just basically the question is if you have used Kubella. But uh, unfortunately not, but it's a very interesting point, so it's, uh, I've learned something new today. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had the chance to play with Kubella, unfortunately. Should try it though. I will give you the promise. <laughs> next, uh, next year, I'm going to be talking about Kubevela. <laughs> <laughs> There's another question down there. Do we still have? Yeah. Um, so, question, um, it goes in the same direction, like uh, the restore question. So, if it means the instance, the state, the configuration state of our instance lives in your Kubernetes cluster, now do you have to back it up? <laughs> well, I mean, part of the backup is already, you know, keeping all your manifests in the Git repository, right? That, that's already part of it. What you're not backupping, but I mean, by backupping only the, the YAML files that are in your Git repository, you're not backupping, though, the state, right? Because Crossplane pretty much keeps this link between, okay, this is my object inside Kubernetes, and this is my cloud resources outside. So. I, I haven't played too much with like backup and restore of Kubernetes of uh, sorry crossplane, uh, but yeah, I, I can explain that you would have to also back up some additional information. Uh, all this is stored in a TCD and it's easy to get through the APIs. But yeah, backup and restore it's, uh, it's still a hot topic uh, around the crossplane world. Yeah, put it this way. Because we, we try, that's one thing that we saw when implementing CRDs. If you s save stuff in the state part the backup restore using Valero is not taking care of this. So this is yeah. like backing up to the like, um, Kubernetes state is pretty hard. Yeah. And if, if you lose your cluster or parts of your cluster and then you lose your infrastructure, this might be a, a bigger issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. I agree. Uh, I haven't had the chance to play too much with like the backup and restore strategies. I know there are ways of doing it. 
but they are not as straightforward as, as, as you know as you would have liked them to be, right? When you are in the situation of doing a restore, you're already like you know like <laughs> you don't want to think too much. You want the yeah. you want the, the thing to be quick, right? You want you don't want to think. You just want to hit a button, do a couple of operations, do a restore. And that's unfortunate. At the moment, it's not the case yet with Crossplane. And the second thing would be: um, Is there an import flow, especially like if you want to gradually maybe move over from Terraform to 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 um, to Crossplane? Is there a way to have a nicer import flow, or even an import flow at all, than Terraform import? Is this something that mm -hmm. okay? I have my main database. I cannot just recreate my database. Like, can I move yeah. it over? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it is possible. So in these resources, you have, to, you have the possibility of specifying annotations that allow you to say, OK, this resource that you, I'm just creating inside my cluster, you don't have to create it new, is this other resource that is already there. Uh, okay. it, it, as m most of the things in Kubernetes is done using annotations. Uh, yeah. Some people call annotation the junk drawer of Kubernetes, where people stuff all kinds of things. Uh, but yeah, this, this is the way it would be done right now. Perfect. Thank you.